Well, hello everyone. Welcome to this podcast on sea urchin gastrulation. Much of the material here is not covered very extensively in your textbook, and that's because uh, I think it's important that you are exposed to some experiments that some of your professors have actually participated in. Some of the work that we're going to talk about uh, in this podcast I was actually involved in a very long time ago. I did my PhD work working on sea urchin gastrulation, and when I first came to the University of Wisconsin, I also studied sea urchin gastrulation. So with that little introduction, let's dive right in. This slide provides a diagrammatic representation of sea urchin gastrulation. Remember that cleavage divisions produce a blastula, and it turns out that partway through the blastula stage, one end, the vegetal pole, flattens, and this is a prelude to the onset of gastrulation. Gastrulation begins by the ingression of cells colored pink in this diagram, skeletogenic or primary mesenchyme cells. They're called primary because they're the first ones to move into the interior. Primary mesenchyme cells ultimately will migrate about and they will form uh, aggregates that will secrete a calcium carbonate skeleton to form needle-like projections called spicules or skeletal rods. After the ingression of primary mesenchyme cells, the flattened vegetal plate region, the vegetal pole of the embryo, will undergo invagination. And this forms the early part of the gut rudiment, or the archenteron. Archenteron simply means primitive gut. That's on the upper right. You can see at this time that the primary mesenchyme cells have begun to migrate, and they've aggregated into a couple of large clusters, and then a, a ring of mesenchyme cells forms around the embryo. All right, after the initial invagination of the archenteron, some cells become active at its tip. This is another group of mesodermal cells called secondary mesenchyme cells. And these cells extend long phyllopodia, thin needle-like actin-based protrusions, towards the animal pole. They probe the kind of the northern hemisphere, the animal hemisphere of the embryo, extending and retracting, extending and retracting. But eventually, as the archenteron elongates, they make contact with a region near the animal pole just underneath something called the apical plate, which you can see in the diagram on the lower right. Skeletal rods have begun to grow at this point, and so the embryo uh, is transformed from a somewhat spherical shape to a more prism-like shape, and so this uh, stage of, of development is often called the prism larva stage. And you can see that the archenteron then is elongated most of the way across the blastocele towards the animal pole. Here are actual pictures of embryos. This is figure uh, 712 from your text. And this shows that um, how gastrulation works in an Atlantic species called Lytokinus variegatus. So you can see across the top, then, primary mesenchyme cells pop into the interior via ingression. The vegetal pole flattens to form the vegetal plate. This then invaginates to form the archenteron on the lower left in this series of photographs. This is then followed by the deepening of the archenteron to about halfway across the blastocele. And you can see that there's an opening at the base of the archenteron. That's the blastopore. Now if we follow embryos out a little bit further, again this is figure 712 from your text, you can see that the archenteron eventually elongates across the embryo to the animal pole, the top in these uh, figures. And as you can see in the middle panel on the top, eventually the archenteron attaches just beneath this thickened region of the ectoderm called the apical plate. These skeletal rods have begun to grow, and uh, eventually they get longer and longer, so the embryo be becomes transformed into a sort of a prism shape. In the middle on the, on the bottom, uh, you can see that the embryo at this point is sort of shaped like Darth Vader's mask from Star Wars, and that's due to these skeletal rods elongating. And so uh, eventually you get a prism-shaped larva, as you can see on the lower right, with a blastopore shown in the diagram, and these elongating skeletal rods. <clears throat> right, so uh, let's look at a movie which shows the ingression of primary mesenchyme cells. The vegetal poles at the lower right in this diagram, animal pole at the upper left. You can see some rounded cells. Those are primary mesenchyme cells beginning ingression. So let's run this movie forward. You can see that these cells 
pop into the interior. That means that they are losing their connections to the vegetal plate as they do so, and they pile up just on top of the vegetal plate after they're done ingressing. Quite a striking event. This is actually an epithelial mesenchymal transition. The cells are starting off as epithelial cells connected to other cells. They move into the interior as mesenchyme cells. So this is a classic EMT. The movie on the next slide um, shows primary mesenchyme cells that are labeled green with a green fluorescent protein so that you can see their shapes a little bit more easily. So on the left here are just the fluorescent cells. Those are the primary mesenchyme cells. And you can see that there are stalk-like connections that they have just before they completely let go of surrounding tissues and move into the interior. On the right are, uh, is the fluorescence superimposed upon uh, the Marsky microscopy that allows you to see the neighboring cells in gray. So let's run this forward. You'll get the idea. The animal pole in this case is towards the lower right, the vegetal pole towards the upper left. You get the idea. You can see that these cells maintain stalk-like connections and finally they snap those connections and become highly rounded and move into the interior. This is a classic ingression movement. So let's look at what's going on here diagrammatically in the next slide. This is figure 713 from your text. When sea urchin eggs are fertilized, one of the components that's found in cortical granules that's released are uh, protein components that form an extracellular matrix layer called the hyaline layer. It's actually clear, but it's colored green in this diagram for clarity. The hyaline layer then is on the outside of the embryo, and primary mesenchyme cells are connected to the hyaline layer. The cells of a sea urchin embryo are ciliated. This is what allows sea urchin larvae to swim through the seawater. And primary mesenchyme cells are no different. They also have cilia. On the interior of the embryo uh, is material colored yellow in this diagram. That's the basal lamina. So that's a classic extracellular matrix on the interior of the embryo that lines the blastocele. Let's consider a cell that's going to ingress colored pink in this diagram. In this case, this cell loses its cilium. And eventually it's going to detach from the neighboring cells colored gray, which remain epithelial cells in the vegetal plate. As the cell begins to ingress, it protrudes into the interior, and in fact, it's going to interact with the basal lamina. Eventually, it's going to produce protrusions and migrate about within the interior of the embryo. So as we follow this forward in the rest of this diagram, you can see that the cell begins to lose its attachment to the hyaline layer, that's panel D in the middle, here on this slide. The cells begun to round up and interact with the basal lamina on the interior at the top, and it's maintaining a vestige of its connection to the neighboring cells as a stalk. Eventually that stalk is retracted, and the cell pops into the interior along with other cells that have ingressed. So these primary mesenchyme cells detach from neighboring cells and the hyaline layer on the outside. They also then have to begin interacting and migrating along the basal lamina on the inside. And so I think you can imagine that this requires changes in the molecular uh, apparatus on the surface of these cells that allows them to do this. Now again, this is a classic example of an epithelial to mesenchymal transition, or EMT. To see how dramatic this detachment is, here's a scanning electron micrograph, figure 818, from an, a previous edition of Gilbert cell in the middle is a primary mesenchyme cell and you can see that it's beginning to detach and you see that stalk-like connection that it's maintaining to the outside. Given the fact that primary mesenchyme cells detach in this way, if we had a way to measure their adhesive properties, we might make some predictions about the changes in their adhesive properties that they undergo as they move into the interior. Now in particular, we might expect that primary mesenchyme cells would lose their adhesive affinity for hyaline layer proteins on the outside of the embryo. And because they have to detach from neighboring cells, they might lose their adhesive affinity for um, neighboring cells at about the same time. Conversely, because they have to interact with the basal lamina, 
lining the blastocoel, we might expect that they would increase their adhesive affinity for basal lamina components. And it turns out that Dave McClay's lab, that was actually the lab that I did my postdoctoral work in, um, uh, did some, some nice experiments to quantify changes in adhesive affinity. The way they did this was uh, to isolate micromeres. So micromeres are much smaller than other cells in the early embryo, and you can isolate them based on their size using something called a sucrose density gradient. The details aren't important, but suffice it to say that you can purify large populations of these micromeres. They will go on to differentiate as skeletogenic mesenchyme and they will undergo the very same changes in their cell surfaces that they would have undergone if they had remained intact in the embryo. So in other words, micromeres undergo autonomous differentiation to form skeletogenic mesenchyme, and that's great because we can then isolate large quantities of them, and we can place them in a specialized chamber and measure the forces required to dislodge them from various kinds of substances or groups of cells that we place them on. And the results of that kind of analysis using a centrifuge are shown in the next slide. This is a table from an earlier edition of, of Scott Gilbert's text. So what we're going to look at are changes in adhesive affinity, uh, and we're going to look at various populations of cells. First the micromeres when we initially isolate them. Then we're going to look at, at the descendants of these micromeres at about the time that if they'd been left in the embryo they would have undergone ingression and begun to migrate as primary mesenchyme. And then as an outgroup we'll compare these primary mesenchyme like cells to other cells in the gastrula stage embryo, ectoderm and endoderm, the remaining cells in the embryo. And we're going to look at their adhesive affinities for hyaline proteins cells from gastrula stage embryos, or the basal lamina. So 16 cell stage micromeres have a particular affinity. You can actually measure it in dynes if you really get into that kind of thing. So you can get a hard number there. And we get an adhesive affinity of 5.8 times 10 to the minus fifth dynes. That's the force required to dislodge these cells from purified hyaline layer proteins. You can see that 16 cell micromeres have about the same adhesive affinity for epithelial cells, gastrula stage cells. Notice that they have a very weak affinity though for the basal lamina. Two orders of magnitude lower affinity, so 4.8 times 10 to the minus seventh. So they have, they stick about 100 times more tightly to hyaline layer proteins or to gastrula stage cells. And that makes sense. Micromeres need to adhere to other cells, and there is no basal lamina yet. So they don't need to develop adhesion receptors that will allow them to interact with the basal lamina. Now though, let's compare to what happens at the time that these cells would normally migrate into the interior. Now we see a dramatic change in adhesive affinity. Look at the middle row in this table. Migratory stage mesenchyme cells lose affinity for the hyaline layer, so they become about 100 to um, 400 times less adhesive to hyaline layer proteins at about the time they would normally ingress. The same thing happens with regard to their adhesive affinity for other gastrula stage cells. It's down about 400 fold. Conversely, look at the entry on the right side of the middle row in this table. Migratory stage mesenchyme cells have much higher affinity for the basal lamina, about 100 times greater affinity than 16 cell stage micromeres do. And this makes sense. When these cells ingress into the interior, they need to, uh, they need to migrate along the basal lamina, so it makes sense that they would develop the molecular apparatus on their surface that would allow them to do this. Now let's compare them to an outgroup, gastro stage ectoderm and endoderm cells. These cells have pretty high affinity for hyaline. They remain connected to the hyaline layer. They don't detach as migratory stage mesenchyme cells do. And they maintain their adhesive affinity for neighboring cells. That's the middle column on the bottom row. <clears throat> However, they don't need to migrate along the basal lamina, so in fact they have a relatively low affinity for basal lamina. So we take all of this together 
This was really the first quantitative demonstration of developmentally regulated changes in adhesive properties of cells in an embryo. That's what makes this um, bit of data analysis historically important. And we can draw a wider conclusion. The conclusion is that changes in adhesion occur during ingression or other epithelial to mesenchymal transitions. Okay, so, so far we've analyzed the uh, adhesive changes in primary mesenchyme cells and some of the things that they do when they ingress. Now let's consider the invagination of the archenteron. You remember that the flattened region called the vegetal plate undergoes this invagination. And uh, the initial invagination of the vegetal plate is called primary invagination, which is what's shown in this micrograph, which is really a beautiful micrograph from a former colleague of mine, Chuck Edinson at Carnegie Mellon, Carnegie Mellon University. You can see then that the primary invagination involves a simple inpocketing or invagination of the vegetal plate. And we've seen this kind of event before when we've analyzed worm gastrulation and ventral furrow invagination in Drosophila. In each of those cases, we saw that simple inpocketings like this involve apical constriction. And this is another example of that kind of an event. Now eventually, the, this simple invagination undergoes uh, a second phase or deepening of the invagination. Archenteron elongation, as we'll see, involves convergent extension of the archenteron once it has initially formed via this primary invagination. Okay, so let's look at a movie of primary invagination, again in Lytocytus variegatus, an, uh, an Atlantic coast species. This is from Dave McClay's lab at Duke University. So as we run this forward, you can see that the vegetal plate begins to invaginate. You can see a dimpling, and you can see the blastopore forming at the base of the archenteron. And the archenteron invaginates about a third to one half of the way across the blastocele. That's what we mean by primary invagination. The embryo is wiggling here because there are cilia. It's swimming. It's been stuck down with the molecular glue that allows it to stay largely in place. Here it is again. You can see the, the invagination forming, now deepening. You can see that there are some cells. These are actually pr uh, secondary mesenchyme cells begin to become visible at the tip of the archentron. More on that in a few minutes. All right, so let's look at what's going on during primary invagination. Here's an embryo. Uh, actually, I, I produced this embryo uh, many, many years ago. Uh, this embryo has been stained with a dye that picks up F-actin. And you can see that there's a, a high concentration of actin on the outer or apical surfaces of cells in the vegetal plate during invagination. And the white arrows show two sites where cells have begun to undergo apical constriction. So apical constriction is occurring in the vegetal plate, and this leads to cells that are sort of shaped like uh, um, old-fashioned hand-blown glass bottles. And so sometimes these kinds of cells are called bottle cells. So the arrow on the left in particular, you can see a cell that's shaped like this. It's highly constricted on its outer surface, and it's kind of bulbous or rounded on its interior surface. And sites where these bottle cells appear are sites where you get an, an uh, in pocketing of the vegetal plate first. The next slide shows a scanning electron micrograph, which I also generated, and you can see um, some of these cells, these bottle cells, very clearly. And that's where these cells form are the regions that are the most deeply invaginated among cells in the vegetal plate. So a number of years ago, a former graduate student of mine, Beth Laxon Kimberly, tested the functional importance of these bottle cells for primary invagination. What she did was to use a laser beam to kill off these bottle cells as they form during primary invagination and then look at the effects on the continued invagination of the vegetal plate. And then what she did was to measure the depth of the archenteron in these laser ablated embryos, these cells that have been zapped with a laser beam. And the next slide shows a movie of one such embryo that she um, treated with the laser beam in this way. So uh, I think you can see that more deeply invaginated regions of the archenteron are shown in red and orange. Less invaginated regions are shown by the cooler colors. So let's just rotate this around. Let's let this play. I think you can see the regions that Beth ablated. They're the green or less deeply invaginated regions in the archenteron. 
So what this shows is that laser killing of these bottle cells leads to loss of invagination, and this suggests that they're functionally important for primary invagination, and in fact, maybe they contribute to primary invagination. Now there's some other hypothesized uh, additional contributions to primary invagination, but I think this is the best, cleanest set of experiments that shows that bottle cells are important for primary invagination. All right, so primary invagination involves apical constriction. Now let's look at the elongation phase of Archenteron extension. And here's a movie by Chuck Ettenson and a student in his lab, Seth Ruffin, Ruffins, uh, again in the Atlantic species Lidocinus variegatus. So this movie starts at the time that primary invagination is over. And now you're going to see that a group of cells, secondary mesenchyme cells, become highly active at the tip of the archenteron. And let's just let this movie play and you'll get the idea. So as we run this movie forward, you can see these secondary mesenchyme cells are highly active at the tip of the archenteron. And the archenteron is going to elongate towards the upper right. So that by the end of this movie, the archenteron has made a connection near the animal pole to complete the process of archenteron elongation. The second phase of archenteron elongation is often called secondary invagination, and you get the idea. It involves the extension of the archenteron, and you can see, I think, that the interior central region of the archenteron has become much narrower by the end of this process. And you can also see that secondary mesenchyme cells have made a very firm connection to a region just beneath the animal pole of the embryo at the upper right by, at, at the end of this movie. So the question is, what morphogenetic movement is driving elongation of the archenteron? Well, we've seen elongating tissues before, haven't we? And it turns out that, as we've seen with some of these other elongating tissues, convergent extension is driving archenteron elongation. And in fact, uh, Chuck Ettenson and I, at about the same time, showed in different sea urchin species that convergent extension is driving this process. And you can do a really simple experiment that doesn't require sophisticated microscopes to show this. You can section through the archenteron at the end of primary invagination, and you can count up the number of cells around the circumference of the archenteron. And uh, you know, for the species that I was working with for my PhD thesis, there are about 24 to 30 cells around the circumference of the archenteron. If we wait and do the same experiment again with embryos that have undergone archenteron elongation, however, we see something different. Now if we look at the number of cells around the circumference of the archenteron, there are far fewer cells around the circumference, maybe six to eight cells. If you count up the total number of cells in the archenteron, though, it hasn't changed. So the number of cells around the circumference of the archenteron goes down as it elongates, but the total number of cells is roughly constant at this time. And the only way that you can get this kind of reconfiguration of the archenteron is if cells in the archenteron change their positions. In fact, they do it by convergent extension. Now you can show this a little more nicely, I think, by introducing a patch of fluorescently labeled cells into the vegetal plate of an embryo. In this case, in the experiment here, this is an experiment that I did, um, we're looking at a Pacific Coast species of sea urchin called Lidocinus pictus. That's shown on this slide. So you can see an embryo at the beginning of um, gastrulation. You can see that there's a little wedge of fluorescent tissue labeling the vegetal plate. But if you look at embryos that have those kinds of wedges of labeled tissue later after archenteron elongation is over, uh, and that's on the right, you can see that there are labeled cells, but they're interspersed with unlabeled cells. So these fluorescent groups of cells introduced into the vegetal plate become highly elongated, and they're interspersed with unlabeled cells. That's a hallmark of convergent extension. So this is further evidence that convergent extension is driving archenteron elongation. So that's the basic movement, but the question is, what forces drive archenteron elongation? Well, in the early 1960s, embryologists doing time-lapse movies of sea urchin gastrulation noticed that archenteron elongation begins about the time that secondary mesenchyme cells appear at the tip of the archenteron. And if you look at embryos, these are really prominent. So here's a really beautiful slide, again from Chuck Ettenson at Carnegie Mellon University, and you can see that um, uh, that these secondary mesenchyme cells are very, very prominent at the tip of the archenteron. And you can see that they extend phyllopodia. There are a couple of, of these cells where you can just see them extending these very, very thin extensions into the blastocele. 
what you can see is that these phallopodia make connections to the ectoderm at the upper left in this diagram near the animal pole. Um, and a very um, smart embryologist who did a lot of the early time-lapse movies of sea urchin embryos, a guy named Trigva Gustafsson, noticed this as well. And so in some of his classic um, drawings of what he saw under the microscope, he saw that these secondary mesenchyme cells extend phyllopodia and they make connections to the ectoderm. These are sort of like Spider-Man's webs making attachments that, and then Spider-Man pulls on those webs to exert tension. And uh, Gustafson noticed that where phyllopodia made connections to the ectoderm, they pulled out little what he called cones of attachment where they attached to the ectoderm. So this indicates that these phyllopodia extended by secondary mesenchyme cells can pull. And so Gustafson suggested that it was the pulling of these um, phyllopodia, rather like Spider-Man's webs, that pull on the tip of the archenron and stretch it out, sort of like um, pulling on a piece of bubble gum you've been chewing. If you get nervous and pull it out of your mouth and you play with it with your fingers and you pull on that bubble gum, it gets stretched out. And that's the way that Trigba Gustafson thought secondary um, invagination or Generon elongation worked. But you'd like to do an experiment to test this idea. Well, when I was a graduate student, I used a microscope hooked up to a really big laser. The laser was as big as a, a whole room with uh, lasers bouncing around on mirrors, kind of a scary thing, to blast secondary mesenchyme cells, prevent them from forming these phyllopodia, and ask what happens to our Gendron elongation. And the results of that experiment are shown on the next slide. So here's an embryo. This is a Pacific um, species, Lytokinus pictus again. Um, and you can see a prominent secondary mesenchyme cell in the panel on the left, letter A. Right after blasting it with a laser beam, that cell's not too happy. It withdraws its phyllopodia. And you can do this with lots of secondary mesenchyme cells in the embryo. The other cells in the interior of the embryo, primary mesenchyme cells, are quite happy. They migrate about. If you leave them alone, they'll migrate quite happily. So in letter C is what happens when you kill off all of these secondary mesenchyme cells. There are no phyllopodia produced, and you can see that the archenderon arrests at about two-thirds of its normal final elongation. So secondary mesenchyme cells can be inactivated in this way. When you kill all of them, the archenderon cannot elongate across the blastocele completely. So what this suggests is that you don't need these cells initially, but that you do need them for full convergent extension. And Trig Gustafson was likely right. This is probably by virtue of the fact that these cells exert forces on the tip of the archenron and they pull it out. They distend it to complete elongation. You can actually get pretty quantitative with this. So here is, this is actually a figure that was in my PhD thesis. So this is ancient history, but it gives you a sense for what you can do here. So um, if you kill all secondary mesenchyme cells, and that's shown by um, the solid line with the uh, circles, the open circles. Uh, this stops elongation of the archantron, and it stops at about two-thirds of its normal final length. If you kill off all of these cells somewhat later, it immediately stops further elongation of the archantron. That's the open squares. But if you leave a few of these cells, that's the filled squares, then what you find is that the archenderon continues to elongate, but at a rate that's much slower than a normal embryo. That the normal embryo is shown by the dotted line with the X's. So taken together, what this seems to say is that you need these secondary mesenchyme cells and that they make a quantitative contribution to elongation of the archenderon. And it's probably because they pull on um, the archenderon to cause it to elongate. Now, uh, evidence that, that the archenteron gets pulled on late during gastrulation uh, comes from the shape of the archenteron. Remember, we said that it gets very narrow in its middle. And this is something that engineers call necking. This happens with plastic materials when they get pulled on, like that bubble gum that you, you play with uh, if you get nervous and pull it out of your mouth and pull on it, or silly putty or something like that. And so the, the movie on the next slide shows this happening. So here's an embryo as it's elongating. <clears throat> 
and you can see that it gets really narrow in its midsection. This is also further evidence that the arc aneurysm gets pulled on. Okay, so let's pull all this together. Early on, initially, the arc aneurysm seems to be able to elongate on its own by convergent extension. The mechanisms by which this happens are a little unclear. But this takes an, uh, an arc aneurysm that has about 24 to 30 cells around its circumference and causes it to become narrower by convergent extension. Later, secondary mesenchyme cells appear at the tip of this arc aneurysm. They make contacts with the animal pole, and this allows them to exert forces on the tip of the arc aneurysm, which completes elongation, causes further cell rearrangement, especially in the midsection of the arc aneurysm, causing it to become very narrow. All right, so so far we've looked at primary mesenchyme cells, they ingress. The archanteron undergoes an initial primary invagination by apical constriction, and then it elongates by convergent extension. Our urchins are great for examining the extracellular matrix during all of this, and so let's talk a bit about that. The next slide shows a, a sea urchin gastrula stained on its outer surface for hyaline layer proteins in red, and on the interior for basal lambda components in green. You can see that there are two such layers. We can ask, are these layers necessary for normal gastrulation? Again, the one on the outside is called the hyaline layer. The one on the inside, that's the basal lamina. Well, we can test the requirement for the hyaline layer by incubating embryos in an antibody, which binds the hyaline layer proteins and prevents the embryo cells from attaching to the hyaline layer. This causes um, the uh, cells of the embryo to detach from the hyaline layer, and we can address, well, what effect does that have on the embryo? The effect's actually quite dramatic. And here is what happens. This is an experiment I did a number of years ago. So here's a normal embryo on the left with its archenteron elongating across the blastocele. But these blocking antibodies can be used to block adhesion to the hyaline layer, and you can see the result of that on the embryo on the right. Um, the blister there, that's the hyaline layer detaching from the embryo. And you can see that some primary mesenchyme cells are in the interior of this embryo, but it cannot do anything with regard to archenteron invagination at all. So the conclusion here is that attachment to the hyaline layer is required for invagination. Here's a movie of such an embryo that's been treated with one of these antibodies, and you can see that um, boy, the archenteron just doesn't do a darn thing. Mesenchyme cells migrate about quite happily in these embryos, but you can see that they can't really do any epithelial morphogenesis, including the archenteron. All right, well, we've seen that primary mesenchyme cells develop an affinity for the basal lamina. It turns out secondary mesenchyme cells also have to attach to the basal lamina. So let's look at what happens when we perturb the inside extracellular matrix, the basal lamina. We can do that using a chemical which prevents cross-linking of one of the components of the basal lamina, collagen. So a, a drug can be added, it happens to be called beta amino propionitrile, big name. And this weakens the basal lamina and uh, therefore um, causes problems for mesenchyme cells which need to interact with the basal lamina. And I think you can see that this causes problems with migration of mesenchyme cells. And moreover, it causes problems with archenteron elongation. So when you perturb the basal lamina, you get kind of a kinked archenteron, or secondary mesenchyme cells can't attach, and archenteron elongation fails. So the conclusion here is that the basal lamina is also required for normal morphogenesis of a sea urchin gastrula. All right, now there's one other item we need to discuss. There are these really great populations of mesenchyme cells. Primary mesenchyme cells are going to form these skeletal rods or spicules on the inside of the embryo, and secondary mesenchyme cells are required to make an attachment of the archenteron to the place where the mouth is going to form, and we saw that they're required mechanically to pull on the archenteron. So let's look at the, the information that might reside in the embryo that seem that instructs these mesenchyme cells about where they should migrate and where they should stop migrating. First, let's consider the skeletogenic or primary mesenchyme cells. This is figure 714 from your text. 
and shows these skeletogenic mesenchyme cells on the left, uh, you can see that the two clusters of these cells form very prominently. If we zoom in on the right using scan electron microscopy, you can see that these cells actually begin to fuse with one another. And this is part of them getting ready to secrete these little skeletal rods. These skeletal rods are really interesting from a kind of a, a chemical perspective because they elongate from little triangular rudiments and get much longer, and that's really interesting, but we're not going to talk about that. So these skeletogenic mesenchyme cells migrate, they fuse to form a syncytium, but very importantly for us, all of this happens with an incredibly precise pattern. And it's these, these pattern groupings of cells that ultimately secrete these skeletal rods or spicules. So the next slide shows a movie of this happening. So here's one of these um, clusters of primary mesenchyme cells at the top uh, on the screen here. And let's just run this movie forward, and you can actually watch one of these skeletal rods beginning to form. At the top of the screen, the primary mesenchyme cells have formed a small so tri-radiate calcium carbonate spicule. You can see the As the mesenchyme cells advance, the spicule grows. And there are actually other cells that are hanging out with these guys begin to join the party by fusing with this group of fused cells that's secreting the skeletal rod. It's really great, very clear beautiful example of very specific spatial localization of a structure in an embryo. And if you look at a Pluteus larva, it's what gives the Pluteus its spaceship structure. So here's a very beautiful polarized uh, light image of a, uh, a Pluteus. And you can see these skeletal rods forming. They form a beautiful bilateral pattern. The next slide shows a movie of some of these guys viewed with polarized light microscopy swimming around. Here's uh, a Pluteus. This is a, a Mediterranean species, Paracentrotus lividus. This is a movie from Christian Gache and uh, Thierry Lepage um, from Nice. And uh, you, you get the idea. It's really beautiful, really obvious, right? So if you mess up something here, you're going to be able to, to, to see it. Here's a bunch of these Plutei all swimming around together. Really cool. All right, so let's look at this patterning process. So in this diagram, primary mesenchyme cells are colored red, and they ingress from the vegetal pole, as we've seen. They migrate around using phyllopodia. Ultimately, they're going to cluster on the ventral side of the embryo. And if we tip the embryo up on it, uh, and look at it from its bottom, from the, veg from the vegetal pole, uh, that's the lower right diagram, you can see that there are these ventral clusters of these cells that are very, very prominent. Other cells form a ring connecting to these two clusters. So these skeletogenic cells adopt this precise pattern of two clusters. The question is, what's providing the information for these cells to do that? Well, we need a way to perturb the normal patterning of these cells, and then we need to do some experiments. There are a couple of possibilities, I think. One is that these red cells here are hardwired to go to these two clusters and adopt this really beautiful pattern. Another possibility, though, is that it's the embryonic environment which provides the information to these cells. So the cells migrate about, but they're looking for information that they might find in the ectoderm, the outer cells of the embryo. So let's develop a way to disrupt this pattern and then perform some experiments to see whether it's the mesenchyme cells themselves or their environment which provides most of the information. Well, we can do that. So it turns out you can treat embryos with nickel chloride. Nickel's a heavy metal. Your mother probably told you listening to heavy metal music is bad. Well, here's the proof that heavy metals are not good for you. And uh, you can see that when we treat embryos with nickel chloride, it completely disrupts the bilateral symmetry of these skeletal elements. And now you get a bunch of little tiny triangular spicules forming all the way around the embryo when we look up at it from the vegetal pole. So nickel disrupts patterning, and this is called a radialized pattern. Instead of two clusters, we get a, about a dozen of these spicules forming all the way around. And this allows us to do a really nice experiment. Pure embryology, but really clean. And that's shown here. We can take an embryo, a normal embryo, or an embryo treated with nickel chloride, and do the following experiment. We can put a, a pipette into the blastocele and flush out all of the primary mesenchyme cells from such an embryo. What's left then is an ectodermal shell. 
we can isolate one of these pieces of ectoderm from a normal embryo or from an embryo treated with nickel, so from a radialized ectodermal environment. We can take labeled primary mesenchyme cells from either a normal embryo or from an embryo treated with nickel and introduce them into one of these shells and ask, what do they do? So these ectodermal shells can be made in this way and we can do mesenchyme cell transplants. We can do mesenchyme cell transplants from a normal embryo into an embryo treated with nickel and see what happens. Or we can take mesenchyme cells from a nickel treated embryo and put them into a normal environment and see what happens. This will allow us to sort out whether it's the ectoderm that's providing the information or whether the mesenchyme cells themselves are hardwired normally and the nickel treatment is just confusing them directly. So let's look at the results of this kind of an experiment. Well, what we're looking for is the following. If we put cells into a normal ectodermal shell and they form a normal pattern, regardless of what type of embryo we got the mesenchyme cells from, this would tell us that the ectoderm is providing the information to form this beautiful pattern of skeletal rods. If conversely we put normal mesenchyme cells into the ectoderm of a nickel treated embryo and the pattern is completely disrupted, then we know that the mesenchyme cells are normal but now the, the information in the environment is abnormal so they're confused when we put them into this confusing environment. So let's see what we get. That's shown on the next slide. The embryo on the left <coughs> represents normal primary mesenchyme cells, fluorescently labeled red, put into an ectodermal environment that comes from a nickel treated embryo. So you can see that normal cells put into an abnormal ectodermal environment form a radialized skeleton. They don't form that nice bilaterally symmetric skeletal pattern. Conversely, mesenchyme cells from a nickel treated embryo put into a normal environment form a beautifully normal patterned skeleton. So the conclusion from this is that it's the ectoderm that conditions the environment and it's the mesenchyme cells that are responding to the ectoderm. And there's very good evidence that the ectoderm is secreting localized growth factors that at least in part help to specify where these two bilateral clusters of cells are going to hunker down and secrete skeletal elements. And the evidence for that is shown on the next slide. This is figure 715 from Gilbert. So this is in situ hybridization for a fibroblast growth factor family member. You can see that the ectoderm is producing this FGF, messenger RNA, into highly um, localized bilaterally symmetric sites. Conversely, the mesenchyme cells are producing an FGF receptor. So the idea here seems to be that there are two localized sites of ectoderm that are producing FGF, the mesenchyme cells respond to the signal, stop, and begin to secrete the larval skeleton. Now exactly why it is that these particular patches of ectoderm begin to produce FGFs, well, that's not so clear. Okay, so primary mesenchyme cells are responding to the environment. What about secondary mesenchyme cells? Well, I will tell you up front, the molecular information that's responsible for all of this is unclear at the moment let's look at some descriptive and embryological experiments relating to secondary mesenchyme cells. So here's a scanning electron micrograph from a guy named John Morrill who's a really accomplished uh, microscopist and shows you that secondary mesenchyme cells are attaching to a region near the animal pole. When they contact this region, what we know from watching them using time-lapse microscopy is that they stop producing protrusions. So whereas they were extending and retracting Phyllopodia and exploring the interior of the embryo, when they touch this specialized region just beneath the animal pole, they stop doing that and they have very long-lived attachments to this region of the embryo. This is actually work that I did many, many years ago as a postdoctoral fellow before I came to Wisconsin. So there seems to be some specialized region of the animal pole to which these cells are responding. Well, how can we show that this region is special? 
But one thing you can do with sea urchin embryos is you can poke them, dent them, squish them. You can do all kinds of interesting things to them. So let's use that to our advantage, and that's shown in the next slide. You can take a pipette and mash down the top of the embryo. So this allows phyllopodia to interact with the animal pole to which they would eventually normally attach much earlier than they otherwise could. When you do that experiment, as shown on the top row, secondary mesenchyme cells rapidly attach to the animal pole. They stop their exploratory behavior, and if you withdraw the pipette, the embryo remains very flattened because its archeneron is attached to the animal pole much earlier than it normally would. If you make dents in other regions of the embryo, the secondary mesenchyme cells just whiz right past that dent and attach to the normal site where they would normally make their stable connections. So when the animal pole is dented down, these secondary mesenchyme cells seem to respond to this region, but they don't care about other regions. So the conclusion is that there must be a specialized region near the animal pole to which the secondary mesenchyme cells respond. It's sort of like flypaper. There's something, some molecular difference up there to which these cells respond by making stable attachments. So I told you I did this work. This is in the dark ages before computers could be used to generate movies. So here's uh, some frames from a, a video recording that I did many, many years ago on the next slide that shows the results of this experiment. So you can see the embryo on the top. I'm, I'm denting down the roof of the embryo. Phyllopodia are attaching to this dented region, and then you withdraw the pipette as you see in, in uh, the lower left, letter C. The archeneron is abnormally short, but it remains firmly attached. So the conclusion is there must be some specialized information up there. We don't know what the molecular cues are, but uh, I'm pretty certain that eventually we'll discover what the molecules are that mediate this kind of behavior. We'll see other examples of this kind of very specific interaction of phyllopodia with molecular cues in the environment, where we do know some of the molecular cues later in the semester when we talk about growth cone guidance and the embryonic nervous system. All right, well, I hope you've enjoyed this discussion of sea urchin gastrulation. I hope uh, that uh, this podcast will be useful to you because you can go back and review this data and rewind some of the movies and look at them in more detail. Thanks for listening. We'll see you again soon.